Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the IBM Kiskit Live Quantum Seminar Series. I am so thrilled to have you with us today. We have a special seminar that we'll roll out in just a minute here with Cheyenne. And that's why we have this amazing music that Paul here is setting up the show with today. So thank you, Paul, for making that happen and the great animations at the start. Now, folks, you know that before we get started on the seminar, we have a tradition, a tradition to type in the chat where you're tuning in from. That's the same place where you can interact with myself and Cheyenne today during the talk and ask questions and discuss uh, everything there is to know about the topic. Uh, we also love to have folks discuss amongst themselves in the chat and just generally to keep it very lively, fun and nice. And uh, today, you know, we've got folks from Chicagoland. Hello, Ron, uh, Kevin from San Diego, Paul from Oregon, from India, from New York City, where I am myself based today. And it's very good to be back after a few weeks of vacation. And while we're waiting for folks to reply in that comment chat box, I'd also like to bring to your attention a very special announcement that the Kiskit Global Summer School videos uh, from the summer school that happened uh, this summer. We had something like 6,000 students enrolled from all over the world. Many of you on this uh, seminar tend to uh, have gone to that school in the past. The videos are coming up next week, early next week. Uh, we'll be posting those on YouTube uh, from lectures like Olivia, John Watrous, myself and others. So look forward to that as that will be a great uh, building block that you can use for staying in touch with what's happening on the seminar. So with that, folks, I think it's time to remind you that this seminar takes place every Friday at noon Eastern time and will be recorded. But to know what's coming up, click like and subscribe. And today, uh, it's my pleasure to kick off episode 137 and to bring here to the screen for you Cheyenne Majidi from IQC Waterloo and the Perimeter Institute. Hello, Cheyenne. How are you today? I'm good. I'm doing well, thanks. It's great to see you after quite a few years. You started your PhD, you're now about to end your PhD. Uh, I know you're doing a lot of things outside of research as well. Maybe you'll have a chance at the end of the seminar to tell us more about that. Um, sure. So I look forward to that. And before I let you take it away here, allow me to introduce you to the rest of our audience. So Cheyenne is a Vanier scholar and a PhD candidate at the Perimeter Institute and the Institute for Quantum Computing at the University of Waterloo. Cheyenne is co-supervised by Raymond Laflamme and Nicole Younger Halperin. Cheyenne is also the lead author of an upcoming textbook, Building Quantum Computers from Cambridge University Press, which will be coming in 2024 fall. So with that, Cheyenne and folks, take it away. Yeah, thank you. So um, I'm going to explain what everything in the title means. Uh, but first, why a seesaw? So the, a seesaw is my cartoon picture of what a phase transition is. And so you can think of a seesaw as having two phases. In one phase, the right child's in the air, and the other phase, the left child is in the air. Say the right child's in the air, and you gradually increase this child's mass. Eventually, there's a phase transition where the child, or the seesaw, tips over, and then the left child will now be in the air. So there's that phase transition. There's a point uh, during that that would be the critical point, and this is where the seesaw is horizontal with the ground. So it's this point separating the two phases. Those are, those are critical points, and they occur in phase transitions. Now imagine I take the child. I'm gradually increasing their weight, and they start to fall. They get to the horizontal point, but then they just stay there. I keep increasing the child's mass, but no matter how much I increase the mass, the seesaw stays parallel with the ground. That would be a critical phase in this setup, and that's what we found in this work. And those are a lot less common than critical points. So let me take a step back, though, and introduce uh, something called monitored quantum circuits. This is the playground in which we, we found this critical phase. And the reason people care about these circuits is because they want to understand entanglement dynamics. So for example, entanglement can be a resource for quantum computing. You know, If we have initially pure states, then we know that we need at least a volume law amount of entanglement in the system. We need a lot of entanglement to be able to do 
universal quantum computing. Entanglement also underlies thermalization. So a very natural question is how do unitary reversible dynamics lead to something irreversible like thermalization? And the answer is that, well, a system will become sufficiently entangled with its environment such that when you trace out the environment, what you're left with is a thermal state. So it's because of entanglement, we, we understand how thermalization emerges from, quantum, in, from, from purely quantum picture. Also, uh, entanglement is useful for understanding the difficulty of classical simulations. So this is related to the first point, but systems with only entanglement with their um, nearest neighbors can be efficiently simulated classically with things like uh, tensor networks. So across physics, a lot of people are interested in this question. How does entanglement grow, spread, and fluctuate? Well, there's one tool for studying these questions that I think is pretty neat. And I'm just going to walk you through the setup. Say we have L qubits in some initial state rho i. So here, L is 8. And then time runs from the bottom of the slide upwards. And then throughout the circuit, I'll implement random unitaries. And what these random unitaries will do is they'll tend to entangle the qubits. This uh, the picture in here, this is called a brickwork faction, uh, fashion because the unitaries look like a stack of bricks. Then throughout the circuit, I'll implement projective measurements done with some probability P. So that's what each of these blue dots mean. So if P was zero, there would be no blue, do blue dots throughout the circuit. If P is one, there would be dots everywhere. So that's the frequency of the measurements is determined by P. So there's three types of randomness here. The unitaries are random, the measurement locations are random, and the outcomes are inherently random because of Born's rule. And so here you can already see there's a bit of tension. The measurements want to disentangle, the random unitaries want to entangle, and intention, tension is the start of any good story. So we're gonna study these some more. Actually, is there anything I can clarify about monitored quantum circuits? Maybe I don't see the chat, but. Yeah, I think, um, folks, this is a great time. If you have any questions, post it in the chat, and I'll bring it up uh, to Cheyenne. At, uh, okay, Sue, I will just wait. Sure, okay, I will just wait to be interrupted as needed. Okay, so what do we see in these circuits? What's interesting about them? So one thing that's really interesting is the existence of a phase transition. So let's take our circuit again from the last page, and now we'll run the time to some late time we get some final state row F and we split the system in half and we get some reduced state row A. We can measure the von Neumann entropy of that row A and what we get is the late time because we ran the circuit for a long time, bipartite because we split the system in half, entanglement entropy. That's what this value S is. And by studying S, we see that these circuits have an entanglement phase transition that occurs when the probability of measurements equals a critical probability PC. So we have three different potential regimes for, for P, less than PC equals to PC greater than PC. And we look at the entanglement growth with the system size in each of these regimes. When P is less than PC, we're in the so-called volume law phase because the entanglement grows to the volume of the system, which for one dimensional chain is just the length of the chain. When P is greater than PC, we have an area law phase where the amount of entanglement doesn't depend on L. So if I double or triple the size of my system, I have the same amount of entanglement. And then precisely at P equals PC, we have critical dynamics. So we're at this critical point and the entanglement grows as the log of L. So this is an entanglement transition. It's really interesting. And there's another way we can view it that's completely equivalent. So now let's say our row i is maximally mixed and we run the circuit. Eventually, row f will become a pure state. The measurements will eventually, well, I'll say, purify the state. Uh, an intuition for this, you can think that, you know, if you wait long enough, there will eventually be a blue dot at every single point, And then you're necessarily purified. So that's just an intuitive picture for why that should happen. So this entanglement transition can be viewed as a purification phase transition, where at some characteristic time scale, tau p, which I'll call the purification time, we have in the volume law phase, which I'll also now call the mixed phase, the purification time is exponential in L. It takes a really long time to purify. 
in the area law slash pure, fa pure phase, the purification time happens at a constant value. And then in the critical dynamics, the purification time scales with L. So that particular scaling is, is important and I'll explain why later in the seminar. So here we have an entanglement slash purification phase transition. Okay, so that's one phase transition that occurs in these circuits. There's also a second type of phase transition that can occur with an added structure. So people have studied modern quantum circuits um, at great lengths. I think actually last year there was one uh, Kiska talk on modern quantum circuits. This year, this is the fourth one that I remember. So I think at this rate, in a few years, IBM Kiskit seminars will be purely about monitor quantum circuits. So clearly they're a topic of, of interest. So people have studied them with a lot of different structures. And so one is a charge. So a charge is a conserved quantity, such as energy or particles. So I can denote by sigma alpha the poly matrices and by zero and one, the eigenstates of sigma Z. Yeah. And uh, yeah, before we let you get too quick, uh, too far. Sure. Question from a man, although I have to say, I really like your uh, extrapolation here. This is <laughs> we know what to book now, right? For the for the 2024, right. it's all it's all measurable. Um, the question is, what about the the p exactly equal to zero case uh, from a man? Oh, yeah. Do you want to say a little bit more yeah, about that particular point? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. So I think um, if you go to the case where p equals zero, you can look at the purification time, and it's probably obvious that it never purifies. So there must be some exception here. And uh, yeah, the person asking the question is exactly right. Things do look very different at p equals zero. And so in the purification picture, um, you actually, you'll never purify. In the entanglement picture, you actually have something very interesting in that um, when p equals zero, when, when you have no measurements, the first measurement does a lot of disentangling. It actually disentangle, decreases your entanglement of, as an order one term. But then after that, each subsequent measurement decreases the entanglement by a much smaller amount. So there's actually this very special point when p equals zero. And I can see it's probably obvious from the purification picture that that point is very special, um, but it's actually also very special in the entanglement picture. And it's some, part of the reason why there was a lot of confusion around these circuits at first. So I think a natural question is, well, take that first measurement, you decrease entanglement by some order one amount. Now look at your unitaries. Your unitaries are only increasing entanglement by an amount that's proportional to the boundary. So shouldn't the measurements always win? And you would definitely come to that conclusion and people early on in the field did come to that conclusion if you don't realize that the P equals zero case is actually different from the P equals just slightly above zero case. So yeah, it's, it's a very good question. Okay, great, thanks a lot. <clears throat> and what, what about P equals yeah. to one? <laughs> P equals one, yeah. So that is another interesting case um, where you have the, the measurement only dynamics. That's also been been studied uh, at quite some length. There's an interesting work where people did measurement only dynamics with pairs of sites. And they find that even with measurement only dynamics, you can have phase transitions between volume laws and area law uh, states. So um, when people are talking about measurement only dynamics in P equals one, usually the question then becomes, okay, what type of interesting operators can we measure to find new dynamic regimes? Right. Thanks a lot. Yeah, well, it's a good lesson there. Always look at your extreme cases. Okay. So we have, yeah, so we have our, our poly matrices and we have zero and one are the eigenstates of these, of the sigma Z. So we can create this operator, uh, which is the total Z component of the spin. So there's a sum over the poly matrices on each individual site. So that's what these J's mean. This is the Jth site of some chain I have. And it's proportional to the number of qubits that are in the state one. So I'll denote by M the eigenvalue of this operator, which is gonna be my charge. And if it's my charge, I want my circuit to conserve it. So my circuit has gates, my circuit has measurements, they both need to conserve M. And so I can set up a circuit that does this, and that's what they did in this work here. And what they find is a charge sharpening transition. So if the measurements happen uh, often enough, one can learn the global charge from local measurements efficiently. So I'm, the way you can think about this is that I'm measuring single qubits fast enough, asking them, are you in the zero or one state? Faster than the unitaries are scrambling that information. So I can determine the global value of, of ones by doing local measurements of ones. However, if I don't measure often enough, I'll take some measurements, but before I can go and take more information, uh, measurements to complete the story, 
the unitaries have already scrambled everything. So there's this transition in whether you can efficiently learn the global charge or, or you can't. So this phase transition, I think, is really interesting because uh, it raises the question of what if the charges are non-commuting? So what if measurement of one charge disturbs the measurement outcome of another charge? A reason that we should think that would be different is that it's no longer clear if we can even learn the charge. So if the measurements aren't commuting, a future uh, or ladder measurement will render some of the partial information irrelevant. So can you even have a charge sharpening transition? Another question that uh, is also interesting, and the reason to think that this might be the case will come in a moment, is whether the charge, um, the non-commuting charges change the entanglement dynamics. So in the U1, in this picture here with a single charge, we have a volume law phase, we have a critical point, and we have an area law phase. Does that, do the phases change? Do the existence of certain phases come and go if we change to non-commuting cases? And can you clarify for us when you say <clears throat> learn the global charge, right? What, is this the global charge that's of the initial state? And uh, is it, you know, yeah, maybe clarify there. So originally we'll have um, some string of qubits and they'll be initialized to let's say zeros and ones. We'll just keep it simple. It could be a superposition of those, but let's just say half our system is one, half our state is zero. We'll then run some random unitary dynamics and now we have a superposition of states but the unitaries are conserving the number of ones. So you have a superposition of states of an equal number of ones and zeros. The measurements will then project us back to some of these states. So we start with some number of ones and we wanna learn how many ones we have in the end. And we're doing local measurements to figure that out, but the unitaries are constantly hiding that information by entangling the state. Is that, what? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's the initial encoded charge, uh, which is conserved through the circuit evolution of yes. both parameter than unitary evolution. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so this question, um, what happens if charges don't commute? Fortunately, is a question that a lot of other people have also been asking recently. So much so that it spawned a subfield of quantum thermodynamics. There's a Nature uh, Review Physics article that's been accepted, it'll be out soon, but it's currently on the archive. So that's what this reference to is here. And it has a summary of the recent developments of the field. But let me just give you a, a brief snapshot of it. So charges are ubiquitous in physics. This isn't something that's a monitored quantum circuit thing, but you usually see them in a bit of a different setup. Usually you have some small system and it's interacting with some environment, exchanging something. And so this, this something that's conserved between the environment and the small system is a charge. Maybe you have multiple of them. And usually when we study charges, we're asking questions like, okay, what state does the small system thermalize to? However, an implicit assumption um, is that the charges commute. This assumption, for example, underlies derivations of the thermal states form that we've seen in undergrad. And it also underlies, for example, derivations of the Onsager coefficients. So that's things like Fick's law, Fourier's law, the Seebeck effect, the Peltier effect. These questions around transport of, of conserved quantities make this assumption. Now, things both quantum and classical uh, systems can have non-commuting charges, but non-commutation plays a particularly important role in quantum mechanics. You know, it underlies, for example, uncertainty relations. So we're very interested in this question of, well, what if charges don't commute? What changes? That's what this whole subfield is about. So I can't survey everything that's been done, but let me just pick out a few results that are related to the questions we're studying here. One is a reduction in entropy production rates. This was done, studied in, in this work here using a collisional model. Another was an anomalous deviation from the thermal state. So there's something called the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. And it allows us to make statements about when the time averaged expectation value of some operator will equal the thermal expectation value. However, in this ETH is eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, there's always some correction. That correction becomes larger when the charges don't commute. So it seems like we're, we're not getting as close to the thermal state when charges don't commute. And another uh, recent result is that when you try to create comparable models with uh, commuting and non-commuting charges, 
find that the non-commuting charges increase average entanglement. So the reason I picked these three results is because they're all related to this question of what do non-commuting charges do on thermalization, i.e. on entanglement dynamics. So these first two points, reducing entry production, not getting as close to the thermal state, those seem to suggest a hindrance to thermalization. However, entanglement accompanies thermalization. So this result suggests a promotion of thermalization. So what's, what's the answer? How do you resolve this puzzle? And you know, in, in research, we love puzzles. I think one reason we want to solve this puzzle is because if non-cuning charges do hinder thermalization, then maybe we can leverage them for longer lasting quantum memories and quantum batteries. So what are the effects of non-commutation on thermalization and entanglement dynamics? Now, usually, I mean, I've talked about non-cuning charges a lot this last year, and I'm often asked, can you give me an example? Well, you're actually likely all familiar with an example, and that's the one-dimensional spin chain with the Heisenberg Hamiltonian. If you're not, this is just a chain of qubits. We can split them to make these pictures match into some small system in an environment. And what the Heisenberg Hamiltonian does is it has quanta, the different components of the spin hop around. So the total spin in X, Y, and Z are conserved, but they're free to move throughout the system. So you have three conserved quantities, but they don't commute with each other. And this field isn't just in theory. Experimental testing of these ideas has begun with trapped ion systems. Okay, so really, let me just make sure the motivation is super clear now. Let me tie everything together. Different quantum many body physicists, such as Sarang, uh, who's been on this seminar before, are asking the question, how do non-cuning charges affect monitored quantum circuits, or i.e. entanglement dynamics? Quantum thermodynamicists, such as Nicole Younger-Halpern, who's also been on the seminar before, are asking the question, how do non-cuning charges affect thermalization? Also, entanglement dynamics. So we address both of these together and ask the question, how do non-cuning charges affect entanglement dynamics of monitored quantum circuits? So we introduce these charges into the circuits. We find a critical phase. So this is very new entanglement behavior compared to the other cases that's been studied. We discover a spin sharpening phase transition. So even though the charges don't commute, we can determine the global charge. And as we'll see, this is useful potentially for uh, the post-selection problem, which I'll introduce later. And finally, we com complemented our numerics with a statistical mechanics model. I won't detail it here, but, but time permitting, I'll give a high level overview of what these models are like. Okay, so let's dive into these circuits. So what was the, the circuit we were playing with? Well, if you start from the symmetry-free circuit, you can ask the question, okay, how do I get my non-commuting charges into this circuit? So this is how we do that. We're going to denote the total spin components by S alpha total. This is the total X, Y, and Z component of the spin. These are going to be our three charges. For our circuit to conserve these charges, we need to find unitaries and projection operators that commute with this total operator. For the unitary case, there's actually only one operator up to a global phase. And that's this one here. That's a superposition of the ion swap. So to be fully complete, there would be a global phase here, but we can otherwise just parameterize these gates with a single parameter phi. I'll denote M prime as the eigenvalues of just two side operators so that I can introduce these cats. So we have the two qubit singlet state, I'll denote with this cat here, and the two qubit eigenvalue M triplet state with this value here. Using these cats, I can build projection operators. But what's important here is that I'm going to measure whether the qubit has a total spin of zero, that's what this projection operator corresponds to, or whether the total spin is one. That's what this rank three projector corresponds to. So I go back to my circuit. I restrict the unitaries to be SU2 symmetric. I then go and restrict the projection operators. But to do so, I need to have them act on two sites. So I do that. And instead of implementing a unitary and following it by a measurement immediately after, uh, just for simplicity, we'll, we'll just do the measurement in those cases. So P is then the probability of performing a measurement. So at each time step, we either do a two qubit measurement or a two qubit unitary that is SU2 symmetric. And ta-da, we have our SU2 symmetric circuit. 
we have our circuit, let's study it. Now, I've, I keep teasing this critical phase. And if you haven't heard of them before, you might not be as excited about having found one. So let me just explain what they are. So critical points are points that separate phases. And they have characteristic properties. One thing is they have a diverging correlation length. So you can take our chain. We pick two points a distance r apart. They have some co can have some correlations between them. Information of one can tell you something about the other. Often the correlations will have this form of a, of a function of an exponent here that is some scaling constant, and then another term that's an exponential with this term here that's the correlation length. Now, if the correlation length is very small, this exponential term is going to dominate and the correlations die off very fast. However, if the correlations are very large, then distant points will maintain some information of one another. Interestingly, at the critical point, the correlation length diverges. And so you have points that are very distant from one another um, share correlations. Another interesting effect we see is scale invariance. So I'll give a, a discrete intuition for it. And a discrete intuition is a phenomenon called self-similarity. So here you can see that if you zoom in and out, if you rescale the picture, it, it starts to repeat at some type of increment. This is just a given intuition of what scale invariance is like. You can then think of a more continuous version of this picture if you want, which is scale invariance. And it's defined by this function here. By some function of, I'll call it L, I scale L, that's going to be the same as scaling the whole initial function by the same parameter to some exponent. And so, for example, all power law relationships have this feature. So at the critical point, I would expect something like my purification time to be a power law function of the system size. So critical points, the takeaway here, critical points have a diverging correlation length. They have scale invariance. So that's what they are. Now why we care. Critical points show universal behavior. So that means vastly different microscopic systems can share common macroscopic properties at the critical point. So for example, something like ferromagnetic ordering, which is if you take um, a, a magnet that doesn't have a bulk magnetization, you can cool it and eventually you'll see a bulk magnetization and transitions to being a ferromagnet. This process is actually described by the same exponent, uh, same parameters, I'll just say for now, as the evaporation of water to a gas. And what's really neat about this is we can now take all these different problems in physics, and we have this thread that's tying them together. And when we understand one of them, this allows us to understand many others that can seem much more complicated. This is the phenomenon of universality. And so critical phases have this phenomenon. We have critical behavior, but instead of having it at one point, we have it at a whole phase. It's not just an instant, the seesaw isn't just falling and there's this moment that we pass by, it actually stays there. So that's a critical phase. Okay, so that's what they are. How do we actually know if we have one? What do I do numerically to test whether this circuit has a critical phase? Well, one I've already spoken about, this is scale invariance. So I'm gonna look at the purification time and I'll ask, does it have a power law scaling? The point I mentioned is large correlations between distant points. So before I was a bit more abstract about correlations. Here I'll be a more specific. One measure of correlations between two regions is the mutual information. So that's this function here, the, the von Neumann entropy of subsystems A, B, and the joint system. So I can look and see, okay, is the mutual information large? If I had a critical point and I plotted the mutual information, I would see that the mutual information would stay small, it would peak at the critical point, and then go back to being small. But in a critical phase, I wouldn't expect to see that drop. And finally, I can also look at entanglement dynamics. So most one-dimensional systems with log L entanglement scaling are critical phases. Th there are many that don't have this, but the systems that do are often critical phases. So these are the three things I'll look at. So let's look at our first piece of evidence. And this is really our strongest one. So the, the challenge, though, is how do you measure the purification time? How can I determine how fast my qubits are purifying? Now, I could measure all my qubits um, 
but that is going to be challenging. So here's a clever way to do it that Gollins and Hughes introduced. So say we have two orthogonal states from the same, this is, this is called a charge sector, so the same eigenvalues. So here that's the total spin and one of the components of the spin. So this is the Z component. I can then entangle our system with an ancillary to the qubit that doesn't participate in the dynamics at all in this fashion. So if the first qubit's in the state zero, our system is in its one of its states. And if the ancilla is in the state one, it's in another one of its states. The reason I need this other parameter lambda is because these states are degenerate. They have the same eigenvalues. So I need some other label to tell them apart. So what I can now do is I can measure just the entanglement entropy of the ancilla. If you look at the state, you can see if the system purifies, then so will the ancilla. So if I know for certain I'm in the zero state, that means I now know for certain I'm in one of these states. And so now I, I know I'll have a pure state. So this is a clever way to only have to look at one qubit, uh, its entanglement entropy, to determine whether a purification transition has occurred. So we're going to do this with a plot. So I'm going to explain the plot, and then I'll show it to you. So the purification time is a decay rate. So I take the log of this entanglement, and I see that it's going to decay. It decays as this function, and the purification time is there. Let's say I, I guess the purification time, and I just happen to guess it right. Now, in, in reality, you try different things, and you, and you fit the data. But for pedagogical clarity, let's just say I guessed, and I guessed it right. What I do is that I'll plot this log of SA against minus T over my guess for the purification time for many, many different values of L. If all the plots collapse, then I found the purification time for all these different values of L. I found the purification time for all the different system sizes, which is the, the purification time of the system. I think this is really clear with, with one example. So here's the example. You take the log of your and so is entanglement, you plot it against T over my guess for the purification time. That's L squared. I can see that for different values of L, they're purifying at different rates. So I have not found the purification time at this value of P. This one's taking, um, it's purifying much faster than, than the larger L ones. So I did not get the right purification time. However, let me try L squared for other values of P. What I find is that it gets better, it gets better, and then eventually they collapse all these different curves and they stay collapsed. Now, if they only collapsed at one point, I would have found one point where L squared is the purification time. But here I found many different values of P where L squared is the purification time. So there, there's two important things here. One, the curves collapse. So that means I'm, I'm now clearly in some other phase. So after about a third, of p equals a third, I'm in some other phase. And the second important thing is that because the purification time I found is a power law, then this is very strong evidence that we have a critical phase. So we found a collapse, which means we have a different phase, and that collapse is with a power law, so that phase is critical. Is there anything I can clarify about this first piece of evidence? I know Zlaco is not in chat, but I just want you people Maybe pause yeah. just to make sure. <laughs> no, I, mean, I think um, there was a question earlier, so maybe it's a good time to bring it up now, around which type of, uh, it's a bit to the earlier point, but maybe we'll tie nicely into this. It's around uh, when you talk about the entropy, wh which kind of entropy are you referring to exactly? And maybe you can tie that in for us as well. And folks, this is a good time to post more questions and clarification questions and other questions in the chat uh, so we can bring them up to Cheyenne. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a great question. Yeah, this, this is the von Neumann entropy. I don't have a, no KBs were, were brought into the brought into this work. So, yeah, this is the, the von Neumann. And it's the, um, the, the, the typical one, not like a higher order Rainy entropy. So, yeah, that's, no, that's, a, that's a really good clarification question. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Carry on. Wonderful. Okay. So we're pretty excited right now. We're seeing, oh, wow, this, this looks very promising. This is critical. Let's do some sanity checks. Let's check the other things that, you know, let, let's make sure. The second piece of evidence is a large mutual information. So I'm going to use this symbol here 
to denote the mutual information between antipodal pairs of sites. So I have my chain, I have periodic boundary conditions, so it's really like a ring, and I'll pick opposite ends. I'm going to measure the mutual information between them because that's, that's as far apart as we can measure. So if at a critical point, this mutual information will grow quickly as p equals our value of pc, which is about a third. It would peak, and then it would quickly drop. At a critical phase, it would stay large. So here I've plotted the log of this value versus the log of L. And we see that as we approach PC, it is growing, but it never comes back down. Uh, the growth gets smaller, so it's not changing too much anymore. But what we find is that it, it grows and then it stays at that value. We don't see the drop that would have indicated it's a critical point. So this is another very strong piece of evidence that this is actually is a critical phase. So now we can try to fit the log uh, of this function here to this function here with different parameters. And there isn't um, a definitive statement that I have to, to, to have you take away from this plot, but I think it's interesting that this um, par parameter relating these values characteristically changes at around what we find the critical point to be. That's not something that I know how, what to make of that yet, but I thought, you know, there's obviously very, very smart people in this audience here. So I should put that out there that maybe someone, some of the many brighter people than me can, can figure that out. Okay, so that's another very strong, so we have kind of our two uh, tokens of, of that are, are clear. And uh, maybe a quick question from Amar before we get too far. Uh, can you tell us about how to interpret or what the meaning is of the purification time before you hit the critical fates? Or, or yeah, yeah, sure. basically what curves mean? Yeah, exactly. So before we get there, what we can say for sure is uh, given the order that these curves are in, going from the smallest value of L to the largest value of L, uh, the purification time is faster than L squared. You know, if I had done some, some larger function that um, grows faster in L, I could have gotten these to collapse. So I don't show this here, but we tested this with an exponential value of L, and we find a very good fit there. So actually, in this regime, we have an exponential in L uh, purification time. Um, what, a reason why I didn't necessarily emphasize that here is let's go to the extreme case, a very, very small p, where we have mostly just random unitary dynamics. Random unitary dynamics have been studied at great lengths, and we know in those cases that we have volume law phases. So it would be, we, we definitely didn't expect to see any violation of the volume law phase. So the, the small p regime, we weren't overly concerned about. Um, we, we did check to make sure numerics were consistent with the volume law phase, but we never seriously considered the possibility that we may not have a volume law phase. So in this phase here, we have an exponential purification time, and that just means that the, the measurements aren't happening often enough. Uh, so we're, we're measuring the local values of S and whether it's one or zero, but we can't, we're not measuring it fast enough to determine what the global value of, of S is. So yeah, another very good question. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Okay, let's look at our last piece of evidence. And this is really just another, I mean, the first two are, are really pieces of evidence. And I, I've ordered them from, from strongest to weakest. This one is more like a sanity check, let's say. So we have a critical phase. We have, we don't expect to have an area law. So we expect that the entanglement would keep growing uh, with the system size. Just because typically uh, critical phases I mean, most systems with log L entanglement are critical phases. This is the last thing we checked. And we find, OK, this is definitely true. The, the entanglement is growing with L. So we never get an area law. So there, there is no area law. And I think uh, a question we had at one point that I, I just want to address or get in front of is that, well, isn't it obvious that you don't have an area law? Your measurements are on pairs of sites. So even your measurements are introducing entanglement. So Aren't they kind of like unitaries? Aren't they, shouldn't you expect there to just be very large amounts of entanglement? The answer is no. And that's just because in the volume law phase, each qubit is entangled with, on average, every other qubit. Where in the area law phase, these measurements um, project that, so, so that's not the case. And our measurements here are projecting, so we only have entanglement between nearest neighbors. So that definitely couldn't be the reason why. Also, just to, to further emphasize that point, people have done two site measurement only dynamics. And they have found that even with purely with pure measurement dynamics on two sites, you can have volume law phases and area law phases. 
So it's not the fact that the measurements are on two sites that's causing the non-existence of an area law. Let's go a little bit further. We say, okay, there's no area law, but, but what is the law? Well, when P equals zero, our numerics are consistent with, with volume law. P grows with the system size. And the fit isn't so good if we compared it with a log L. But I should say that, you know, with the numerics of this size, you can already see how it's really hard to differentiate L scaling from log L scaling. Uh, one reason, actually, maybe I should just clarify this now, you might ask, well, why did you only go to 20 qubits? People have done numerics with much larger system sizes. Uh, and it wasn't because we were you know, lazy or didn't have access to very powerful computers. We were using Compute Canada's computing clusters. Um, the, the challenge is that we can't use Clifford's here to, to efficiently simulate the circuits because Clifford's don't obey the SU2 symmetry. We can't also, we also can't use tensor networks because we're looking for a transition from a volume law to something else. And with uh, tensor networks, those are only efficient, well, for the most part, they're only efficient when you have area law entanglement. So we just had too much entanglement for tensor networks and we had this non-abelian symmetry which ruled out Clifford's. So we really were limited to exact diagonalization techniques and just brute force. So when P is less than PC, we have this expected volume law. So the entanglement grows with L. So how about now let's look at this point around where we have our, our transition. At P equals 0.35, you can see the numerics are, are kind of consistent with either one. And one thing you'll see um, if you've looked at papers with much larger numerics, so particularly people who can do Clifford numerics, so if you're in a symmetry-free case, you'll often find that the early values of the points deviate from the trend later on. People call these finite size effects, where it's hard to put a lot of weight into the first maybe four or five points. But here, that's almost all we have. So you even go to the limit of P equals one, and you can say, okay, yes, the log L fit is better, but the L fit isn't awful. Um, so in, instead of making some overly definitive claim, I think a fair claim that we can make is that the critical phase we find, uh, its entanglement is consistent with log L. Log L is a, is a perfectly fine, uh, yeah, it, it's consistent with that. I'll leave it at that. So let me recap, you know, what this is before I go to the next result. So in the symmetry-free and U1 cases, so U1 is just if you have a single uh, conserved quantity. In the volume law phase, you have uh, volume law entanglement, exponential purification time, area law phase. Both these things are constant. And at the critical point, you have log L scaling. And here now, you know what scale invariance is. You can see you have scale invariant purification time. You have a power law. Well, let's look at the SU2 case. The lo volume law phase is expected, and our numerics are consistent with it. So I'll, I'll leave that there. And then the real focus of our study is what's happening over here. The purification numerics clearly demonstrate an L squared um, purification time. The numerics are at least consistent with log L entanglement, so that with an asterisk. And the mutual information numerics also indicate a critical phase. So, so we're pretty confident that, you know, we actually do have a legitimate critical phase. That is our, our first result and, and the major result of this work. Okay, 42 minutes, let me see. Okay, let me get to spin sharpening here. Um, I'll be a bit briefer here about what it is and why we thought it may not exist. So in the U1 case, this is the single charge case, we have a charge sharpening transition. So this is the phase where one can learn the global charges value from local measurements efficiently. A spin sharpening transition is measuring local values, so two site values of, of the total spin S, and trying to determine the global value of S. So from local spin measurements, determining the global spin. So in this case, we have information from earlier measurements can be lost. So for example, let's go to the limit of all measurements for a second. We do a measurement on these four qubits and we find, okay, let's say we know that this is in a singlet state and this is in a triplet state. We then go and we do some intermediary measurement. I'll just show one to make the math simple. And this measurement here has uh, some probability, 0.75, of being in the triplet state, the other probability of being in the singlet state. Let's just go with the more likely outcome. It doesn't matter which one we choose. What's important is that when we get to the next step, we've now lost certainty of the state of our four qubits. This measurement doesn't commute with these measurements, 
And now we have some, before we do the measurement, we're again uncertain about the status of our qubits. So we've lost some of our information from subsequent measurements. So the measurements are almost working against themselves. So can there even be a spin sharpening transition? So our approach is actually very similar to the purification time calculation, where instead we pick the two states to have different values of, of spin. And now we can say, well, if we measure our ancilla, it's in the state zero, then we know our system also has spin zero. If our ancilla is in the state one, our global system has spin one. And because our dynamics are preserving uh, SU2, we're not worried about this eigenvalue changing or this eigenvalue changing. And so if the ancilla purifies, if we eventually know for certain that our ancilla is in the state zero, then we know that we can determine the spin. And the short answer is we can. And so we can actually see not only can we, but there is still a phase transition. And this is kind of the spin version of the charge sharpening transition. So here I have the, the log of the ancilla's entanglement, just like before, plotted against P. And I can see is that there's a regime where the, uh, this y-axis depends on the probability in a characteristically different way than it does after some value of p. So the curve crossing means how the log of the entanglement entropy of the ancilla depends on L changes with p. Or another way you can see this, maybe if this is more familiar to you, is you can take the limit of L being infinity you can see these curves are drifting up this way. These curves are drifting down that way. And you'd eventually expect to see a step function. And that would make the phase transition very clear. Now, one thing I want to point out here is the crossing of exactly where the spin sharpening transition occurs uh, isn't clear with, with this size of numerics. So you can see that where L equals 8 and 10 cross is a bit earlier than 10 and 12, a bit earlier than 12 and 14. And so the point in which we would conclude the transition to be is, is drifting a little bit. So the crossing's around a quarter, but it, it's likely a little bit later than that. Okay, so there's actually an interesting application here because you might think, okay, great. You've confirmed that there also is a spin sharpening transition. We already saw something similar with U1. I'll explain exactly what this connection is in the Outlook slide. But for now, I want to point out that these two phases have different um, spin sharpening times, and we think we know what they are. When p is larger than about this value of a quarter, the spin sharpening time is also of L squared. Okay, so it takes L squared measurements to determine the global spin. At lower p, we believe the spin sharpening time to be L cubed. Our numerics are you know, consistent with that with large values of L. The reason we don't have the L equals 18 data here and the numerics here have more noise in them is because we have to run the circuit for L cube time steps. So with L equals 18, the numerics for that took about two days. You multiply that by 18 and now it'd be, you know, over a month to run the numerics for, for this case. So it just wasn't within uh, reach computationally. But, you know, if nothing else, we can say there's a characteristic difference in how long it takes to determine the spin. That in one phase, it'll take you some amount of time. In the other phase, it'll take you a longer amount of time. And, and again, that will be important in a moment. But before I say how it's important, let me just overview one other thing that that's, might be of interest to some of you um, who come from more of a stat mech background. So there's these things called classical statistical mechanics mappings. And here's the spirit of these mappings in these circuits. A lot of progress in the study of this field of entanglement dynamics has come from clever mappings to classical problems. So let's denote by M the set of all measurement outcomes I get in a run of my circuit. So I'm constantly doing these little measurements and I write down every time when, where I took it and what the outcome was. That would create this vector. I denote by this curly U, the set of all the unitaries for one run of the circuit. So if, again, the unitaries are random, I record which ones I did, those would be the, the set of U's. I then, you can imagine stacking all these circuits on top of each other and then averaging over all the different values of M and U. And what that does is it takes me from this many stochastic circuit picture to a single average circuit 
that I can assign a deterministic evolution to. So this averaged out circuit will evolve according to the exponential of some operator, which I'll call our effective Hamiltonian. And then so you can study the effective Hamiltonian. You can ask questions like, what, is it, what are its ground states? So that's the overview of what we did. And what did we learn from this? Well, we learned that the um, circuit we have is consistent with a volume law and the absence of an area law and with the purification time of L squared. So this was, um, yeah, just something I want to briefly mention, but it's at the end of the paper for those who are interested. Okay, let me summarize and make sure I have, I have time for some more questions. So we introduced non-cuning charges into monitored quantum circuits. We found a critical phase. We discovered a spin sharpening phase transition, and we complemented the numerics of the STATMEC model. Where do we go from here? And so this is the thing I was, I was referring to. How do we, can we leverage the spin sharpening problem to help with post-selection? So what is the post-selection problem? Well, each run of these circuits, we're getting random measurement outcomes. If we want to figure out the average behavior of this circuit, then we have to be able to repeat one of these outcomes many different times. Okay, I can't just run my circuit once and get a particular uh, value set like that vector m and then go repeat it and get a different vector m and be able to make comments of the average behavior of the circuit and to be able to get that vector m multiple different times. But there's exponentially many different options. So this is the post-selection problem. One way we could potentially address it is ask the question, can an observer learn which phase the circuit is in from measurement outcomes in a certain number of time steps. So you have the circuit and you say, okay, can you determine whether you, uh, the total spin in, in L squared time steps? If you can, you're in this one phase. If you can't, you're in the other phase. Now you could say, well, what's new about that? There already is a charge sharpening transition. Why can't you use the charge sharpening transition in this way? The reason you can't is that we don't actually in the charge sharpening picture, we have two separate phase transitions. So we can't understand the entanglement phase transition by looking at the charge sharpening. However, our stat neck model also suggests that there may only be one transition, that actually the entanglement transition corresponds exactly with the spin sharpening transition. If that's the case, if these two things correspond, well, we can say, were you able to determine the spin in that time? Yes. Well, if so, we actually also know what entanglement phase you're in. So that's an opportunity to look into. Another thing that uh, we'd be interested in is to understand the critical phase analytically. If you want to do what's very interesting with critical dynamics, we want to use this to understand a variety of different phenomena. We want to connect the critical behavior we're seeing to different microscopic systems. But to do that, we need an analytic understanding of what this phase is. There's this question of entanglement I mentioned before about, you know, do non commuting charges promote or hinder thermalization? Well, overall, we found more entanglement. This is consistent with this paper here. Does this, you know, what does this mean, if anything, for thermalization? And a question that I've, you know, become recently really interested in is the entanglement necessary for quantum computing models. So there's this uh, model here you can find where you with, with SU2 measurements alone, you actually um, can, can do any quantum computation. So SU2 measurements are BQP complete. Now it's actually, it's this paper along with their follow-up paper together, uh, prove this. Uh, in the original paper, they argue you need very particular states, but then later you find you can actually prepare those states with SU2 measurements. So with just SU2 measurements, you can do anything in quantum computing, like it's BQP complete. But here we found that with random SU2 uh, circuits, with uh, random SU2 measurements, excuse me, we have uh, sub-entanglement scaling, a uh, sub-volume law scaling. If our states are pure, that shouldn't be enough for universal quantum computing. So this isn't an impossible resolution. There's actually many possible ways you could probably think to resolve this, but there seems to be something there about understanding what is the relationship between SU2 measurements with the entanglement necessary for universal quantum computing. So I think that's something that'd be interesting to look into. Okay, I wanna thank you for listening. Um, this is not an eyewear ad. This is my, these are my collaborators on this project, but we do all wear glasses. This is the paper I spoke about today. And here's some recent related works from the last, yeah, from about the last year or so. 
Uh, this is the review article I mentioned that'll be in, in Nature Review Physics soon. This is the entanglement, the relationship between non commuting charges and entanglement. And for the experimentally inclined um, who want to know, okay, how do I actually go to the lab and test non commuting charges? Uh, this is the paper you'd be interested in. And as was mentioned, you know, if you're teaching a quantum computing course in the coming, you know, in next year, um, and it's a, it's a course that related to hardware, uh, you know, please look into this book, Building Quantum Computers, an introduction. It'll be available, um, at least start to become available next year and, and into 2025 in different parts of the world. Thank you very much for the wonderful talk and the nice pedagogy and uh, congratulations on the nice results, folks. Wonderful time to post your questions in the chat. And I see we have uh, some streaming in here. So maybe I'll bite off with a question from Shashi Kumar. Can critical phase preparations become a test for verifiable supremacy, if you like that word or dislike that word, of quantum computing? And this ties back to something you mentioned earlier, uh, I guess, about uh, the batteries and so on. So I'll, I'll let you take that as, right. as you will. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you. No, thank you for that. That's yeah, it's an interesting perspective. I think the um, whether you can have some kind of quantum advantage and like what things are signs for quantum advantages is an incredibly interesting area of research. So I think um, be because we can, like, so we are able to, to uh, create a critical phase just numerically on my computer. So I can say so much as, okay, there's at least, you know, so some classical context in which I can do this task. So it, you know, I don't, it shouldn't be, uh, I shouldn't need a quantum computer to do it. And I was able to do it with my, with my own computer. Um, but again, there's, there's many questions here of around what resources are, are necessary um, for having some advantage with quantum computing. So I think yeah, earlier in the talk, I mentioned two references for entanglement being a resource for quantum computing. I mentioned both because they're kind of um, in, in, not in conflict, but, but they, impose, they give very different perspectives. So the one paper is a paper about DQC1. It's a type of complexity, a class of problems you could do with a quantum computer where you have actually very, you have very little entanglement throughout the circuit. And actually at times you have no entanglement. And what you can do is still problems that a classical computer cannot. So you actually don't always need entanglement to get a quantum advantage. And if you have an initial state that's mixed, you, you don't. But if your initial state is pure, then you do, you know, has been proven that you do need a lot of entanglement. So the, the question of, you know, um, how do we generate entanglement? What has a lot of entanglement? How does entanglement help us in different contexts? Um, the question really depends on, you know, what are we trying to do and what's our initial setup? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that, that thought provoking question. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Cheyenne. Um, and can you tell us more? Excuse me. Can you tell us more about the uh, last paper you mentioned relating to, you know, how do you begin to probe this on quantum hardware and devices? And uh, a lot of the curves you looked at are not things you can really measure easily or maybe at all in a, in a large scale quantum experiment. So uh, what, what is, what's yeah. the outlook or some of the thoughts around how to begin to look at some of these same questions in physical devices where, you know, we can now start to do experiments to the level of 120-ish plus qubits, depths of maybe 50 or so. We have some experiments on that. So, yeah, but give, give us a perspective. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So I think there'd be, um, maybe there's two ways I could, I could answer that question, two areas that I think would be interesting. One is really just from the non-commuting charge angle, um, trying to understand the physics of non-commuting charges. So as I mentioned, uh, charges non-commutation violates the derivation of the thermal states form. So not that long ago, this is a legitimate question around, you know, what is the thermal states form if the conserved quantities don't commute? Um, I think one way I can, I think, make that intuitive, if you imagine the thermal states form, you have an exponential of usually a, a sum of a bunch of operators. Now, if those operators commute, you can always decompose that as a product of a bunch of exponentials. But if they don't commute, you can't. So even at like a very immediate level, we can see, okay, once things don't commute, we now, uh, some of the equalities we're used to using don't work. It's actually even, it's a bit more nuanced than that in the actual derivations of it. And those are in the review article I mentioned. Um, but, you know, what is the right thermal form? How does the Grenon commuting, one quantity, affect the flow of a quantity it doesn't commute with? When the quantities do commute, we, we studied this. We know how 
heat flows, how, how differences in, in a temperature, so a temperature gradient, what that does to a current, for example. That's well understood. But what if the quantities don't commute with one another? Now, there's a lot of theory that's been constructed for this, but this theory is at the level of channels. So often, you know, that's, that's one of our favorite tools. We have an input. We want to do something to it. We get an output. So as theorists, we love that. We don't give a channel to an experimentalist. So how do you go from a channel description to a Hamiltonian description? So that paper I have there, that, that's what that does. So what you do is it's a procedure where you put into your procedure what your charges are. So you'd say, for example, I want to conserve an SU3 symmetry, let's say. Maybe you're studying something like color charge. And you'd say, OK, I also want this to be a genuine pick your number of bodies. I want it to be a genuine three body interaction. And I want to have nearest and next nearest neighbor coupling. Sure. You put those in and what it spits out is a Hamiltonian that allows you to go do that on your hardware now. So it's like a translation tool between the language of channels that the theorists like to use and the Hamiltonians to then go test the physics of non-commuting charges. So, so that's what the focus of that work is. And then in terms of monitored quantum circuits and those being implemented on, on quantum hardware, um, there's, I mean, a, a lot has been done with that recently. There's, I think, three really um, impressive experimental results that have all approached it different ways. There's actually, a, a, just last week, a very nice Quanta magazine article came out uh, about it. So maybe I'll just, I'll, I'll defer to that. I don't know if Quanta is a rival of you guys. I don't know if I should be advertising other <laughs> media sources. Okay, you guys yeah, they, can censor me if I said something I shouldn't have. Yeah, we're censoring you. No, they have really high quality yeah, yeah. stuff. Uh, that's a big fan. Yeah and good graphics. Um, OK, so yeah, that paints it for us a nice and exciting picture. Since you mentioned SU3, um, OK, you've done U1, you've done SU2. What happens at SU3? Have you thought about that? Or you know, SUN or yeah. you know, what, where? Right. where <laughs> how does that, how yeah. does that tie in? And of course, the SU is one type of symmetry, and it's a clear one for quantum mechanics to think about. But uh, yeah, maybe do you want to tell us a little bit more about the importance and connection of that type? Yeah, so I think um, with the monitored circuit picture, we actually we talked about doing uh, other symmetries. Uh, I think th the only reason we didn't was you said, okay, we still don't an analytically understand uh, SU two. Um, let's just let's try to solidify this and put our energy and time into seeing if we can figure out the uh, maybe like a field theory description of what's happening here before we try to to push things harder into into SU three. But in terms of, for example, studying um, Hamiltonians that conserve SU three conserved quantities. We have a pretty detailed prescription um, of that in the experimental connection paper. So in the appendix, we go through how to build the Hamiltonian to study um, a system of, of non-community conserved quantities that have an SU3 symmetry. So in terms of maybe doing some kind of experimental test uh, to study the dynamics of systems with those types of conserved quantities, uh, at least the Hamiltonian for, for doing that is uh, readily available in, in, in that paper. OK. Awesome. Thank you, Cheyenne. Um, I think this the, with that is probably since we're running a few minutes over and we have many questions during folks this is a great time to post any final question you have here for Cheyenne and myself and uh, I thought I would just leave it to you to for to, to have the chance here Cheyenne uh, to just share any other thoughts news uh, advertisements or or um, messages you wanted to get out to folks as we come to the closing. Yeah, so I guess it's coming uh, a year left in my PhD, and it's a very, uh, a very full circle experience for me because it's like when I chatted at the very beginning of my PhD. At the time, I was super interested in getting involved with scientific outreach, and I have to say, for, for a lot of I know uh, people listening to this are graduate students or starting grad school. I have to say, one of the most fulfilling experiences I had uh, throughout my academic career was going to visit uh, high schools and sometimes even younger than that to go and just do uh, outreach and connect people with you know, the frontiers of science, you know, we're so lucky to have the opportunity to access these things. Uh, we can come to these, you know, very well-funded institutes, hear professors from who are world experts on these topics, but a lot of the world doesn't have access to that. And so in, in some ways it's almost like a, you know, I don't want to make it seem burdensome, but almost like a responsibility to, you know, to share that and to, to, to bring that to those who either don't know the, these things are there and to communicate with them. So there's Open Labs, which LACO done, does. There's, there's the Unentangled program in the Waterloo area. Um, but as far as I know, really, any city you go into, there are science outreach programs. That, and it's you know an incredible experience, and I highly recommend it to graduate students who are, who are in the beginning of their careers. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And uh, 
thank you for all the effort you put into that. And uh, it's it's an inspiring message to me. That's how I kept myself going through graduate school. Matter of fact, two, it was two statements. One from Albert Einstein, if I knew what I was doing, it wouldn't be called research. That was very important for making it through most days. And the other one was, uh, in my case, it was you know founding and running Open Labs, which is a science outreach uh, organization. In your case, it was entangled and kind of growing that. And, um, and, and I, I think just having seen also some of the work you did there, it's been amazing. So folks, follow through on it. If you have the time and opportunity, it's really fulfilling. And uh, I think, Shyam, with that, I'd like to thank you again for accepting our invitation and for the wonderful talk. Um, this seminar will stay recorded, so you can go back and rewatch it. But the only time you can ask questions live is Friday noon Eastern time uh, with uh, great speakers like Shyam, uh, hosts like myself and uh, Paul here, who's making us all look good. So, folks, with that, click like and subscribe, and we will see you next Friday at noon Eastern time.